Uh, I would like to welcome our speakers today, John Cottingham, who was a professor of philosophy at Reading University and a Oxford alumni. He has written extensively on the topics of philosophy of religion, Descartes and moral philosophy. Please join me in giving him a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for those kind words. And um, can, can everyone hear me all right? Yeah. If if you can't if you can't at any point, please please wave a hand. I I think I can see most of you. So um, talking today about Descartes and the onto the so called ontological argument. This word ontological is a bit of a mouthful, but it basically comes from ancient classical Greek word for being or existence on onto in Greek. Does everyone have a handout, by the way? Yeah. Um, good, good. Um, so to start, you really just need a very simple distinction between essence and existence. Essence is something's nature its defining qualities, if you like. So the essence of a lion would be what? That it's carnivorous, has a mane, um, has claws, um, hunts um, zebras, and so on. Um, the question of existence is different. We could carry on talking about lions, even if they became extinct. Sadly, that's always a possibility, given the way we're treating the planet. Um, so essence and existence are different. And with most things, you can, as it were, leave open the question of existence. They might exist, they might not. They are what philosophers call contingent. You and I happen to exist, but one day we won't. Uh, a unicorn, as far as we know, has never existed, but we can still talk about unicorns. But in the special case of God, according to this argument, which you may or may not agree with, in the special case of God, his existence and his essence are inseparable. Once you, and according to this argument, once you understand the notion, the concept of God, you understand that God must exist. So existence is part of his essence. Um, if you just look right at the end of the handout, the bottom of page two, um, the argument, the ontological argument wasn't invented by Descartes. It was uh, first devised or a version of it by Anselm, Archbishop of Canterbury. And his version is right at the bottom there. He defines God as that than which nothing greater can be thought, the greatest thing you can think of, and then some. And then Anselm argues, well, that greatest thing, if it just exists as a figment of your mind, like unicorns or Santa Claus, it wouldn't be the greatest thing you can think of. So its greatness implies that it must exist. We won't discuss that today, but Anselm's version has called forth vast discussion among philosophers. And for what it's worth, there are several philosophers today who think it's some version of it is valid. Descartes' version is much simpler in a way. So if you go right back to the beginning of the handout, um, you see that it can be summarized, as I put in bold, about fourth paragraph down. God is the supremely perfect being. He is what Descartes calls the sum of all perfections. You know, our intuitive idea of God in the Judeo-Christian and Islamic tradition is that God is all powerful, all wise, all benevolent, merciful, and so on. Supremely perfect. 
But then, reasons Descartes, uh, existence is one of those perfections alongside his power, his goodness, and so on. So if you define God as the supremely perfect being, he must exist. And I've given you a quotation just underneath that bold paragraph. Uh, De this is Descartes' words from the fifth meditation, written in Latin in 1641. Latin being the language you used in the... Um, uh, in Descartes' time to reach an international audience, rather as English is today. So he says in translation, it's quite evident existence can no more be separated from the essence of God than the fact that its angles equal two right angles, 180 degrees, can be separated from the essence of a triangle. So it's a contradiction to think of God, the supremely perfect being, lacking existence, lacking one of the affections. Well, it, it's interesting to see people's initial reaction to that. Um, there are many worries people might have about the argument, um, but is it plausible to think existence is a perfection that God has alongside his other attributes like power and goodness? I think intuitively one might say, well, existence isn't a perfection. It's what you need to have in order to have any properties at all sort of presupposition of something's genuinely possessing properties. But according to Descartes, this is just going down to the next paragraph on the handout, things have essences whether or not they exist. So triangle, for example, may or may not exist, but it has an essence. It has a nature, for example, necessarily it has three sides. I don't know if people do geometry as part of their maths. Anyone doing maths for a level um, couple? Um, well, I'm not sure if um, Euclid, Euclidean geometry is still taught, but um, if you do basic Euclidean geometry, then um, every, you can prove that every triangle, the angles add up to 180, two right angles. Whether or not there are any triangles in the universe is an open question, but the angles equaling 180 is absolutely certain, it's demonstrable. So Descartes is saying in the same way, God's existence is demonstrable. Just as you can't have a triangle without its angles equaling 180, so you can't have God without existence, as it were, built in to the very nature of the deity. Well, if you look quickly at some of the objections he's raising there, I won't necessarily go through them all, but I think an obvious objection is, well, your thought can't make something exist. M mere concept of God can't guarantee that God exists. Um, so that's objection one on my list. My thought doesn't impose any necessity on the things. An objection Descartes himself considers. And he replies, um, it's not that my thought imposes the necessity on the thing, it's rather the nature of the concept itself that makes me agree that existence is necessary. Just as the nature of how we define a triangle makes it necessary that its angles equal 180. Um, we'll, we'll come back to some of these in, in questions, if you like, but I hope you'll be... 
feel free to raise critical questions about the argument, which may include these objections, or there may be different, different worries you have. Objection two, why, uh, this is Descartes' words, it may be necessary to grant God exists once I've made the supposition he exists, but why was this supposition necessary in the first place? Well, Descartes would agree you don't have to think of God. I suppose someone could go through life without ever considering the question of deities. But what Descartes is saying is you don't have to think of God, but once you do, you're bound to accept that he must exist. It's a necessary connection between the concept <clears throat> and real existence. Um, objection three, bottom of page, or first page, a lot of people say, well, this is circular. It begs the question. The whole argument begs the question in favor of God existing. But Descartes, I think, would reply, no, you can talk about things without presupposing they exist. For example, we can discuss the essence of a unicorn. It's a quadruped. It has one horn. It looks a bit like a horse, uh, but we're not begging any questions about whether it exists. So the argument isn't in that way circular. If we turn over now, objection four, so why is, and I think many people feel this is a good objection, why is existence a perfection? Well, a partial answer to that was given by Anselm, just looking at the bottom of the second page. Um, if something was just imaginary, it wouldn't be very perfect. If something was just a figment of your thought, it wouldn't be as perfect as if it really existed. And I've given you there, going back to the top of the second page, the example of... Um, Santa Claus, if he really exists, then he's more perfect. Why? Well, because in that case, he can move around the world and give people presents. Um, whereas if he's just a figment of your imagination, he's just a fleeting image that can pop in and out of existence whenever you stop thinking of it. Uh, now, number five, which I think some of you may have looked at, or will be looking at, it's a bit more technical. This is an objection devised by Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher, the century following Descartes. And Kant said, existence is not a predicate. Now, how, how many people know immediately what I mean by predicate? Yeah, I, I guess it's a fairly standard notion. If I say John is tall, John is the subject, tall is the predicate. If I say lions roar, lions are the subject, and roar is the predicate. Now, so in that sense, exist is a predicate. It's a grammatical predicate. I can say Santa Claus exists. I can say the Eiffel Tower exists. I seem to be saying something about Santa Claus or the Eiffel Tower. But according to Kant, although it's grammatically a predicate, it's not logically a predicate. And he argues for this by saying, if you say God is powerful, you've got two concepts which you're connecting together, God and power. But if you say God exists, there aren't really two concepts there. You're just saying there is something which is God. In modern logic, if you just look a little further down, modern logicians talk about the existential quantifier, which is backwards EX. Uh, and that's like Ilia in French. I don't know if any of you are doing French, but uh, Ilia, there is, there is a but then you don't know what, you haven't said anything really. So when you say 
there e there exists an X such that um, you're not, as it were, talking about a property or a quality. You're just introducing a concept. So there is an X such that X is powerful, X is all loving, X is merciful. Those are all genuine predicates. But if you say exists, that's not really telling you anything about the object. As Kant puts it, it adds nothing. So it seems a quite technical objection, but actually I think ultimately it's quite a straightforward one that exists is a way we introduce things into the discussion. It's not a, a quality or property like tallness or power or mercy or redness or any of the other properties we're familiar with. Um, and then I'll pause fairly soon because I want to hear some of your questions and we're going to, I think, allow about 10 minutes for questions. This is, in a way, objection six, which I think is my favorite objection, which I've called the overload objection. It was first raised um, by a monk, Gaunillo, in reply to Anselm's version. Um, and um, back in the 11th century, just after the Norman conquest of England. And uh, Garnillo uses the example of the perfect island. And basically he says to Anselm, look, if you're saying existence is a perfection or it's more real, it's more perfect to exist, then you'd have to say this mythical perfect island must exist if it's got all the perfections. Um, so we could, if existence really is a property of this kind that makes something real and perfect, then we could, as it were, wish into existence all manner of things. I've given, uh, this isn't Garnello's example, but my example of, you know, Pegasus, the winged horse. Well, let's consider not Pegasus, but super Pegasus. Uh, which I define as having all the properties of Pegasus plus real existence. Seems to follow that super Pegasus must exist, but that's absurd. So the overload objection says, if the argument were valid, we could define all sorts of things into existence. The perfect island, super pegasus you name it therefore the argument can't be valid because it would give us too many it would populate the universe with all these bogus entities well i don't know what you think of that descartes i think would say as i've indicated that you can't just define anything into existence because that would be a fictitious entity. Fictitious or invented entities are ones that you or I or someone makes up, like the Harry Potter entities or the um, um, or Father Christmas or the unicorn. You just cobble together various features and invent a concept. So Descartes distinguishes between fictitious or invented concepts and genuine, true and immutable concepts. And genuine ones are things like triangles, which we can prove things about. We can, I mean, geometry in geometry, you can discover properties of circles or triangles, which you or I didn't put, put there. They, uh, they're genuine properties of a mathematical entity, the triangle. So for Descartes, God is a genuine entity. I don't know if any of you are looking at the meditations in general, um, but there's an earlier argument in the third meditation, which kind of supports Descartes' idea that God is a genuine concept. 
it's an argument that I couldn't have created it myself. I won't go into that today, but basically Descartes argues that there's something about infinity, the infinite perfection of God, that I, being a finite, imperfect being, could not have made up. It's just too too great for me to have invented. Um, so there we go. That's the final objection that Descartes considers. Um, I'll just mention quickly objection seven, and then we'll then I'll stop and hear what, what you want to raise. Um, this is sort of an objection that Thomas Aquinas, the great theologian of the uh, 13th century, um, made to Anselm's version. He, he says, I put, unless it's conceded that something in fact exists than which nothing greater can be thought, the conclusion doesn't follow. So what he's saying there is, unless you grant that something qualifies for this definition, then you can't prove any results from it. Um, in other words, he's saying it'll only give you a hypothetical conclusion. And if, if there is some X which qualifies as the supremely, utterly, perfect being, then maybe you'd have to concede that it exists. But we don't have to concede that anything does so qualify in the first place. I'll just mention one more thing about that argument, about this argument of Descartes, um, and that introduces this technical term a priori. If you go back to the beginning of the handout, the fourth paragraph there. Uh, this is an a priori argument. That's to say it's independent of experience or observation. Most arguments for God depend on looking around the world. For example, a famous design argument. You find order in the world, therefore there must be a designer or an orderer. So those are empirical arguments. They depend on observational premises, what you find in the world. This argument is purely a priori, as philosophers say. That's to say it depends just on concepts. It's prior to, a priori means prior to or independent of experience. So if, if, if it's valid, you can show that God exists without any observations about the world. Okay, I think I will pause then. Uh, and um, please feel free to raise any questions that strike you as um, worth discussion, however basic. Um, I can't see can't see the audience very well. Would someone like to moderate? Yeah, I, yeah I'll, I'll moderate. Um, yeah. Go on, um, speak, so, up, speak up so John can hear you. Does the fact that the argument is a priori make it weaker or stronger? Um, I think it doesn't detract from its possible validity. I mean, a lot of our reasoning in life is a priori. The most famous example is mathematics. Mm -hmm. you now, mathematicians don't go around doing laboratory experiments. Uh, they work purely a priori from notions like number, con uh, concepts like triangle, and so on. Uh, and in a way, you might think they're even stronger than non-a priori arguments because they don't depend on risky experiments. They, they're, as it were, pure. This is an idea that goes right back to Plato in ancient Greece, that somehow pure logic is uncontaminated with the messy business of observation. Um, so I think as far as that goes, um, it's perfectly okay to be an a priori argument. Yeah. Um, you touched on it a little bit at the end, but given that Descartes' argument relies quite heavily on our definition of God 
being perfect. Would you say that the problem of evil presents a bit of an issue in the sense that actually maybe there could be a God, but actually it might be improbable or even impossible for that God to be perfect? Yes, I mean, that's a fascinating issue you've raised there. And the traditional answer is that um, God is responsible for the creation of everything and that his creation is good. So evil is introduced by, well, what one common defense is to say that evil is introduced by the free choice of human beings, or perhaps devils or angels, if there are any. Um, the other thing about that, I think, is that if you are supreme infinite perfection, you, as it were, occupy all the logical space. If you're going to allow anything else into existence, it's got to be less perfect. If you just create supreme perfection, that's just you, as it were. So there has to be a residual imperfection in anything God creates. Going into that further would would take us too far around, I think. Um, but um, the Descartes' idea really is that God is infinite, so all encompassing perfection. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I'm just wondering if a scholar called Paul Tillich said to speak of God is to limit. Sorry. Um, you want to speak to, up? Go yeah. Speak up. Um, Paul Tillich said to speak of God is to limit him. And I wonder if, uh, like defining God as the greatest possible being, is that using human perspective to, uh, is that use of human perspective, uh, does that limit God? And mm. can we actually conceive of God? Conceive God? Yeah, thanks. That, that That's a very good question. Descartes' reply is that we can't grasp God in Latin comprehendere or comprendre in French, which is, he said, God is rather like a mountain, which you can't grasp, you can't put your arms around it, but you can reach towards it. This is actually a fairly orthodox idea, going back to Aquinas and Augustine, St. Augustine, at the close of the Roman Empire, that God is infinitely surpasses what we can comprehend. But and actually, if you look at the Anselm formulation right at the end of the handout, he's not saying we can fully grasp or understand God, because God is that than which nothing greater can be conceived. So even when you've reached the limit of human thought, God still exceeds it. Okay. So in a, in a certain way, we can't know God. We can't go know God's full nature. But I think Descartes would say, nonetheless, we can know enough to know that some properties are true of him, like goodness, like power, like knowledge, supreme knowledge, and like existence. Here's an analogy. Maybe as finite beings, we can't know all the properties of a triangle, but we can prove some. So that's all I think Descartes means. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, if you consider the ontological argument in the sense that uh, don't imagine a god, but imagine imagine the most powerful evil being you can imagine, you can call it Satan, call it whatever you want. If that, with the same logic as the ontological argument, couldn't you say that the most powerful evil being exists is would be more powerful to exist in reality in the mind than in mind alone? So therefore, it exists. If it's a more powerful, it's the most powerful evil being in the world, the most powerful being. How is that? Does that not contradict the most powerful God in the world? Because therefore, there's a most powerful evil, which could be more powerful than God. Right. That's a good question. Uh, Descartes was actually asked a bit about this by a young Dutchman, Franz Boerman, who interviewed him in 1648. They spoke in Latin, and uh, Boerman took notes of the conversation. Descartes argues, in effect, there can only be one because unity, as it were, is part of God's essence. Why? Because if he's the most powerful thing you can conceive of, 
you can't also think there's an all-powerful demon or devil because in that case there'd be at least one thing each of them couldn't do namely zap the other so they wouldn't be the most powerful being you could imagine so it seems necessary that if you define god as omnipotent able to do everything there could not be two beings of such a kind is that do you, do you think that works why is that being god though there can't be two beings why can't the evil being be the one that is the one that's there and god is the one that can't is it, why does it have to be god right yes that that's an interesting question I, i'm not sure that i can give you a full answer to that but the tradition which goes back to thomas aquinas again in the 13th century is that goodness and being are interconvertible they're interlinked so as it were god pours forth his his goodness in creation in in existing in bringing things into existence and so evil is just a negation of that being and goodness. Um, one argument Descartes uses, which I think is relevant to your question, is that evil is a sign of malice. And why would you be malicious? That's a sign of weakness. You're angry because you haven't got what you want or you're envious of someone as indeed the devil is portrayed in, in Milton, Paradise Lost. So if evil is a malice, is a sign of weakness or of lack, that can't be attributed to God. It takes us a little outside the pure ontological argument, but I think it's, it is relevant. It, if that line of reasoning is correct, then goodness, as it were, excludes the kind of malice or evil which um which would be as it were uh, allow something to be equal with god thank you very much Eddie? um just to touch upon god's omnipotence do you think that descartes approach that god his omnipotence was he could do anything that even if it wasn't logical do you think that contradicts an argument based on entirely of logic um sorry could you just repeat that just didn't quite catch the last bit of that um do you think how descartes approach that god can do more than that is logical contradicts mm -hmm. an argument that's entirely based off logic um i, th I yes that's interesting i i don't think so because we're just we're just thinking about the concepts of power and ability what does infinite power entail what does infinite goodness entail so we're not as it were looking to do any observation or experiment we're just consulting the meanings of the terms so i think there's a reasonable claim the argument has to be based on logic alone to, to pick up your point of course you might say where do these concepts come from in the first place um where do we learn them so it's not as it were pure in the sense that it ignores questions about where the concepts arose from um and you might actually ask how come as finite beings limited beings how come we have this concept of the infinite um we've never seen anything infinite so where do we get it from well descartes answer would be it we're born with it we have an innate inkling of this idea of the infinite we can't have created it ourselves Therefore, it must have been placed in our mind by God himself. This is the different argument of Descartes, which comes, <clears throat> excuse me, comes in the third meditation. It's sometimes called the trademark argument. 
that God, the infinite being, placed this idea of himself in my mind like the mark of the craftsman stamped on his work. Uh, but that's a logically different kind of argument. Hmm. John, finally, um, you've, you've raised some interesting criticisms of uh, and objections of the ontological point of view. What do you think? What do you think of Descartes' argument? Is there a you, you mentioned get, that Galileo for you was perhaps the most successful? I'm intrigued to know, as a professional philosopher yourself, what do you think? Well, um, uh, yes, it's very complicated. I I think it, on its own, my own view is on its own, it doesn't really do the job. But I think in con conjunction with another, some other considerations, uh, it, it points us towards a conception of the deity, which is quite plausible. If you think existence is a mystery, and as Wittgenstein said, the German-Austrian philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein, that the very fact of the world existing is something mysterious, if you think existence is a mystery, and I think it is, then it could only be due to something which is necessarily existing. This goes back to Aquinas again, who defined God as a necessary being. And that links up a bit with the ontological argument, although Aquinas himself didn't accept it. Uh, because, I've, as I've said, he thought it just yielded a hypothetical conclusion. But um, that picture of something which is necessarily existing, then creating all other beings like you and me and the planets and the stars, which are contingent, which weren't always here and will one day go out of existence. That, I think, is quite a powerful notion. So even though I don't really think the ontological argument constitutes sufficient proof on its own of God's existence. I think this idea of God as the necessary being is quite a powerful one. Right. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, yeah. Professor Cossingham, uh, thank you so much for coming to talk to us today. I know we've all found, found your thoughts on the ontological argument incredibly insightful and informative. So if you could all please join me in giving a final hand to Professor Cossingham.